Hello and welcome to this analytical, analytical corner on harnessing renewables in sub-Saharan Africa, barriers, reforms, and economic prospects. My name is Golda Lee Bruce, and I work at the communications department here at the IMF. A few quick notes as we get started with today's analytical corner presentation. We ask you to please silence your cell phones throughout the session. Our presenters will speak for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll have 15 minutes of Q&A with you. So without further ado, let me invite to the stage Sneha Tube and Thibault Lemaire. Good morning. I am part of the team that advises the government of Madagascar on economic policies. And since my first visit in Antananarivo, I've been struck by how much our conversation with authorities on growth and prices were dominated by the topics of climate and energy. And Madagascar is not an exception in the continent. Economic activity is heavily dependent on these two factors. Hence the question, how to increase power generation in sub-Saharan Africa to sustainably meet the region's growing demand for electricity. My name is Thibault Lemaire. I am an economist in the African department of the IMF. And I'm Sneha Toube, also an economist in the research department of the IMF, where I focus on modeling the macroeconomic impacts of climate and energy policies. Today, we will discuss our work on how to harness renewable energy in sub-Saharan Africa. We will draw on results from a recent staff climate note that we wrote with several colleagues and is already available online for your reading. Now, we can all think of many reasons why access to reliable electricity is crucial. It powers businesses, it helps preserve and transport food to markets, it supports public health, or it enables studying after dark. Electricity makes life easier, and it is essential for economic activity to flourish. As you can see in this chart here, over the last two decades, per capita GDP has grown by more than 60% in sub-Saharan Africa. However, Per capita electricity availability has not kept up with the rising incomes and has even declined in this period by close to 10%. Now this represents a constraint on economic activity. With rising population and development needs, a rapid scaling up of electricity production is more important than ever for the region and it will, its success will depend on large part, part on the choices that we make today. So let us take a look at how electricity is currently produced in the region. Of course, there are differences in the scale and the sources of electricity production across countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and hydropower plays a significant role in several areas. But the region has an exceptional solar and wind potential due to its geographical advantages. And despite this, the share of solar and wind power generation in the energy mix is less than half of the global average and is lower than in any other region, as you can see in this chart. In addition to this potential, the cost of wind and solar electricity has decreased dramatically over the last 15 years, to the point of now being comparable or even cheaper than fossil fuel alternatives. This presents a timely opportunity for sub-Saharan Africa to increase investment in this sector. Given these prospects, what are the main challenges that countries in sub-Saharan Africa encounter when it comes to increasing investment in renewable energy? Financing remains one key issue. For scaling up investments in renewables, countries face the following choice. Either mobilize domestic resources, find external financing sources, or use a mix of the two. Now this brings us to the question, do different financing options vary in terms of their economic impacts? To answer this, we use an existing model that represents several regions of the global economy and their interlinkages with greenhouse gas emissions. We further refine the representation of Sub-Saharan Africa and disaggregate it into several countries and regions to better capture its characteristics. Our results show that scaling up renewable energy production with investments financed entirely domestically increases annual GDP levels by 0.15% in Sub-Saharan Africa relative to the scenario that reflects only existing policies. However, when investments are fully financed with external sources, the increase is 0.35%. Now that is more than twice the impact. A balanced combination of both financing sources results in an increase of about 0.3%. So what explains the difference between the domestic and external financing options? In both cases, the resulting access to reliable electricity enhances the productivity of existing companies. But using external financing reduces the fiscal pressures in country that are already working with limited fiscal space. 
Furthermore, it also allows for the use of domestic resources for investments in other sectors that will benefit from improved electricity availability, and this further boosts growth. So you all know that the international community has pledged to provide each year 100 billion of US dollar in climate finance to developing countries. Let us look further at the potential impact of external financing with an illustrative scenario. In this scenario, each country receives a share of total climate finance depending on how far its per capita emissions are from the global average. As a consequence, Sub-Saharan Africa would receive in total about half of this $100 billion annually over the next decade. Then we assume that each country dedicates half of its allocation to the renewable um, energy sector. Our model shows that in this scenario, electricity production could rise by up to 24% compared to the scenario that uh, reflects existing policies. And labor demand from the electricity sector would also rise during this period. And as you can see in this chart, this would in turn boost annual GDP growth by an additional 0.8 percentage point on average. When we apply this additional growth over a decade, it results in a substantial increase in GDP levels. Therefore, the allocation and use of these funds could dramatically impact Sub-Saharan Africa's renewable energy landscape. This raises a new question. What can Sub-Saharan uh, African governments do to attract more financing to this sector? We look at the data and find that ambitious policy reforms in the areas of governance, business regulations, and the external sector can help attract more concessional financing, including grants. Our results show that the adoption of a major package of reforms in these three areas is associated with a 20% total increase in climate finance inflows over a period of four years since the reform. We also find that implementing climate policies is linked with an increase in green foreign direct investments, which is another major source of external financing for the deployment of renewable energy. So, to conclude, we have two main messages. One is for African governments. There is a compelling economic case to rely on renewable energy to meet the expanding power demand in the region. And implementing market reforms and climate policies is essential to attract more concessional climate finance and also investments in the private sector. For the second message is for the international community and investors. External financing is critical and is needed to complement the use of domestic resources to ensure a sizable increase in both renewable electricity generation and GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the negotiation of the new collective quantified goal on climate finance at COP29 next month provides an invaluable opportunity to show commitment to Africa's sustainable development goals. Together with better policies and a strong commitment from international partners, Sub-Saharan Africa's energy landscape could expand in a sustainable way, unlock opportunities for the private sector, and transform lives in the entire region. With this, we'd like to thank you, and we would be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Sneha and Thibault, for your presentation. It's now time to open the floor to your questions. Uh, we have colleagues in the room with microphones, so if you raise your hand, we'll call on you, and you can ask your question. We ask you to please state your name and your affiliation as you do. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm De Jin from China Foreign Affairs University, so thank you for your insightful research sharing us today. Um, I have a question like that you assume we can use a bastard of uh, best use of the uh, external financing, but I think it assumed that uh, under the stable economy, but as how would this projection change in face of the uh, glo uh, global economy recession, especially of the COVID-19 and the stagnation of technology uh, transformation? Do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so that's indeed true that we do assume that there are no major unanticipated shocks uh, going forward up to over the next decade and our results to hold true in that case. Um, what we do, uh, what I would like to highlight is that um, projecting any unanticipated shocks, something like COVID is normally not part of the scenario analysis. So that's not part of the um, sensitivity that we do. However, uh, if you think about technology transfer, so positive shocks that could further you know, complement the scale up of renewables, that, in sense, would mean that uh, global increase in global mitigation abroad would also support 
global mitigation in sub-Saharan Africa by itself because there will be gains from technology transfers. So in, in a scenario where there are upside, you know, positive uh, in, impacts on mitigation, uh, we would say that the results are more like an under, uh, like a lower bound of the impacts and you can certainly expect more gains going forward. We have a question in the back of the room. Hello everyone, I'm Ini John Mekwa, Channels TV from Nigeria. Now, um, it's, it's no news that uh, in Nigeria you have everything, you have the solar, you have the wind, and all of that. Right now we're dealing with the consequences of some reforms, some economic reforms. So it does seem difficult that even though we have the potentials, but actually focusing on that and getting investment, I mean, unfortunately, debts or loans are being taken to pay salaries and all of that. So what's the reality actually, or where can a country like Nigeria start from? We have all the potentials, but actually attracting the investment to start this journey seems to be difficult. Thank you for your question. So we, we try to look at this question in this tough climate note, and we really see that, um, I mean, when those structural reforms uh, that deal with governance issues, that deals with the external sector issues, uh, business environment, when those reforms are implemented, we see afterwards an increase actually in climate finance inflows. So definitely something that governments can do is implementing those reforms, enabling the environment so that this finance can, uh, can flow in. Uh, but of course, uh, we look at it, we find a 20% increase after a period of four years. Uh, so of course, this takes a bit of time to materialize, but this is a way to go, we think. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the floor? Yes, up front. Hello, my name is, hello, my name is Sage it's Thompson, and I'm with the Global Solar Council. Thanks for your presentation. Have you done any work on grid connectivity across Africa as it relates to solar, and could you maybe share some light on that? Thank you. Um, so indeed, in the modeling framework that we have, uh, definitely any expansion and generation of any electricity source needs to be accompanied with an increase in grids in the modeling framework. So that is a con it's a constraint and it's a cost that we do take into account. Um, our results, uh, the staff climate mode also has a lot of details on different regions and the results that it, we, so we've shown results for an average in sub-Saharan Africa, but more granular details are available in the note. Um, something that we don't do is uh, inter-regional grid, uh, you know, like the concept of an inter-regional grid, which we know is quite popular. That's not a scenario that we look at, but within a country, the scale up the, of grid that is needed to accompany scaling up in renewables is definitely taken into account in our analysis. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, in the back. Thank you, I'm Gérard uh, Bussier, I'm from uh, a, uh DFI. So my first question about SIDS, small island development states, uh, who have a lot of uh, sea and uh, who can uh, capitalize on wave energy. So is this uh, something, because you talk about solar energy, wind energy, but what about wave energy? My second question is about uh, the uh, preparation, design implementation of, uh, of uh, renewable energy project. It's very complex, costly. So what could be a motivation in terms of uh, resolving this issue of delays, this issue of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, starting um, complexity in, uh, in starting a project because it takes so much time to prepare a project, a renewable energy project. So I'd like to hear your perspective on this. I take it. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, thank you for your questions. About wave energy, uh, we haven't looked uh, at it. Of course, uh, offshore wind energy uh, uh, is part of wind energy, so it's uh, covered, let's say, by, by the paper, but wave energy, we do not look at it, so we don't have really an answer on that. Uh, about the fact that investment projects in the energy sector take time, uh, of course, this is a reality, but it will take time with any source uh, of energy. Now, solar energy, uh, and wind energy have the advantage to be more flexible than alternative energy projects, uh, which might be more, I mean, much more heavy. Uh, they can also be implemented locally. 
so they would allow for uh, a greater expansion of the grid using mini grids, uh, and that will help also um, increase access to electricity, which has been a challenge uh, in the continent. So it is a topic, uh, clearly, but as with other energy sources, uh, and this is uh, something that is needed to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, there's another hand at the back. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, this is Paresh Narayan from Monash University and the Asia-Pacific Applied Economics Association. Uh, you talked about uh, climate policy reforms. Uh, I wanted to know your views about the feasibility of those reforms in light of the, uh, the existing institutional frameworks, the, the weaker legal frameworks and compliance issues in sub-Saharan Africa. In light of those uh, challenges, and these challenges are historical, uh, how feasible do you think these reforms are? Okay, I can take this. Yeah. Um, thank you for your question. Um, so what we see in the data, so in this study, um, we take the number of climate policies that were adopted, because this is a data set that we have. Of course, it's very important that the policies that are adopted are actually effectively uh, implemented. Um, what we observe in that there are less policies adopted in the region than in other emerging uh, market and developing uh, economies. But we do see uh, some of these policies. And what we see is that once they are adopted and implemented, afterwards we see an increase in climate finance. Um, so despite the challenges, we really think this is the way to go to, to harness uh, renewable energy. Yes, we have time for, I think, two more questions. We'll go over here first. Hello, thank you. My name's Adelaide. I'm coming from Adelaide, South Australia. I'm leading a youth policy fellowship. Um, I've got two questions, if I may. Um, one is, um, coming from South Australia, we play quite a lead role in renewable wind and solar. How do other countries influence your work in seeing how li viable um, it is, and also with that I've seen with the local and indigenous communities some of these projects can be quite invasive and with the stark data saying mixed is great but pure um, international investment is maybe higher impact, how does that work with local communities and thinking Africa informal settlements, um, X, Y, Z? So in the modelling framework, as I, as I had uh, hinted earlier, we use a global model where we add a lot of disaggregation for sub-Saharan Africa for this particular uh, South climate node. So we do have interlinkages in terms of international trade you know, uh, and so on that, that, do, um, that are taken into account in the modeling framework. So that's, that's the way in which we bring in sort of what's happening in the rest of the world into the impacts it would have in Africa, so the changes in prices, uh, trade patterns, and so on. Um, but we, referring to the earlier question, there are other factors that we have not considered in our modeling framework. So things like you know, improvement in technology elsewhere, which would have positive spillovers for the rest of the world. That's something that's not part of our work, but that would then indicate that perhaps our cost estimates, you know, they might not be as high as we think if there are other you know, positive offsetting factors in a way that, that could uh, play a role in this. Regarding the role of local communities, it's, I, I, you know, we agree that this is very important and specifically to have buy-in from you know, uh, on different projects. But this is something that we have not looked into particularly in this assessment, so we're not in a position to answer that. Okay, we had a hand right here in the front. Would you still like to ask a question? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you. I'm Junaid. I'm from Harvard University. Um, my question was, when you do the model, do you use external financing, just the concessional ones? Or do you use like market rate external financing as well? And how does that change the impact? So we do use external financing. Uh, the way it's modeled is through transfers. Um, but we do recognize that there are different ways in, this, in the way this financing could be provided, which could be debt-based instruments, equity, and so on. Um, this is not something that we directly assess, but what you can think of is that it's a transfer that is not repaid over a period of 10 years at least. So think about it in that way, but technically in the model, it is a transfer. Yeah. 
We had one more hand raised, so we'll make this our final question. Uh, just as the people before mentioned that the governance and the external uh, factor can also has the greatest impact on the increase of the fi climate financial flow. But also in the short term, there are many political costs, also the institutional costs of implementing this uh, structural reform. So I wonder how to balance these costs with the long-term financial benefits and environmental benefits. What tools and strategies can governments use to conduct this reform? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, other teams in the IMF have looked at this question, the social acceptability of reforms. Uh, it is a, a chapter of the World Economic Outlook that is released uh, today. So I think the, dis the discussion will, will be much broader if you look at, uh, at this chapter. I will orient you towards, uh, towards this one. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. As we wrap up, we'll give the final word to our presenters. What do we absolutely need to take away from this session? Okay, so just a final word. There are huge development needs in Sub-Saharan Africa and energy needs. Uh, there are great geographical endowments with plenty of sunlight, plenty of wind, and the cost of harnessing energy from these renewable sources has decreased quite a lot over the last, uh, over the last years. So there is an opportunity here, and there is a lot that Sub-Saharan African governments can do um, by implementing the right policies, climate policies, structural reforms. They can attract financing toward this renewable energy sector. Now, of course, the international community and external investment, uh, investors have a, have a great role to play uh, by ensuring that external finance will support domestic efforts. And this is even more important as we're heading towards COP29, where a new, <coughs> sorry, new collective uh, quantitative goal on climate finance uh, will be discussed. Um, since then, we think there is a strong uh, economic case in favor of renewable energy. Uh, in the region and harnessing it will involve a, co um, a collective effort from African governments and societies to external investors and the international community. And in front of these development needs, we really think that time to act is now. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sneha and uh, Thibault. And that brings us to the end of our analytical corner event. Um,